it's almost like a dream you know it's like you go into this like dreamy realm where everything is um abstract and mysterious you know everything's abstract and mysterious there's nothing there's no reference point there's no nothing that makes much sense to this kind of it's like you turn up in an alternate reality like an alternate dimension where nothing is the way it is here you know It was like a, it, it was like an enforced break from, you know, doing certain things. So as I said, we was doing ceremonies and everything. And now it's like, after like a really lovely, beautiful um, period of learning and, and growing, it's like, okay, like now I can share some of the stuff that I've been learning. And uh, mm-hmm. um, Yeah, yeah. I wonder if we can delve into kind of when that all started with you and your journey through, through, uh, I guess, awakening or spirituality kind of let, let's go back into into the old Luke like when did uh yeah. when did that all start for you when did when did you start wearing t-shirts with psychedelic <laughs> entities <laughs> on and <laughs> drumming yeah. in circles yeah okay it's really interesting um actually like because when I was you know 15 a bit younger you know until around the age of 21 22 i was very much into like a street lifestyle you know i was like taking lots of drugs and partying you know like we wasn't the most trustworthy of friend circles that i was moving in you know and we were kind of like just going around quite rebelliously causing trouble and stuff you know and um you know it was my like upon reflection it was my need for connection you know that was kind of like you know if i you know knocked on someone's door and run away or like got myself into a fight you know like you know obviously it started off knocking on doors and running away and then it escalated as you get a little bit older and start drinking alcohol and stuff you know yeah the the, the gateway knock door run (laughs) yeah yeah yeah. you don't know how you don't know what door you're actually knocking on do you yeah yeah yeah. is that what a metaphor we just accidentally (laughs) explored but yeah it was um um yeah it was like a need for connection you know so like if you get into a fight it's like or you know kind of something like that it's like oh did you see that you know what happened you know and it like gives you like a a connection with people around you you know and it's not necessarily the most healthiest of connections you know to um be having but you know it's like upon reflection you can see why these things happen because my understanding of uh, like society and people in general is um everyone like needs some form of connection and significance Mm -hmm. yeah and if you don't if you don't gain your uh, connection and significance through like um healthy loving compassionate kind ways then you're gonna try and get it through another way you know because it's a one of the human needs um but yeah that was my start you know like kind of get that kind of lifestyle actually when i got to like the age of 19 i started to play poker professionally um i was selling drugs and all this kind of stuff you know and um that was my life you know like that was kind of like how i lived you know i ate a lot of junk food and you know just was uh um yeah i wasn't living very consciously and um it was actually through work, you know, like, cause I, I've always worked from home, you know, like, um, online, not always very successfully in the early days, you know, it took a, a while to kind of, um, um, make, make it actually work. But it was, um, I just remember like not being able to focus, not being able to concentrate, not being able to like, um, do a task like I couldn't sit and do a task I'd like sit and I'd like start to write something and then I'd like start to watch a YouTube video and I'd start to like do all this stuff and it would just be like it would it was just not uh sustainable to try and like in trying to achieve things and it was like I kind of remember just being like I need, there's something I need to do about this like it's uh you know like I've at the time I had like a son on the way he's 11 now you know and it's like like I need to do something about this I'm trying to like earn a living and I just can't you know and um 
I looked online like ways to focus the mind and everything. And eventually I found meditation, you know, and it wasn't like a pursuit of, um, you know, spiritual realization or anything. It was more just like, okay, like, let me try this out. Maybe it can help me to pinpoint my focus a little bit. And, um, it was a very short period of time, you know, like I started to meditate. I, I got some binaural beats, which are like, uh, like meditation music. And it was literally within a few weeks, I started to have these real kind of like transcendental experiences. Um, like I had like out of body experiences. I had like, a um, a, an opening of like the, the third eye like had this explosion in my in my mind you know so to speak and it was like very psychedelic I hadn't had any psychedelic experiences then you know but it was like this explosion I had this real kind of like psychedelic experience and it was during that time I started to think like well I started to feel that there was something more <laughs> to life you know it's like okay you know like everything that I kind of felt was real it feels like there's another layer you know and like to use a metaphor it was like i was seeing in 2d before you know like two dimensions you know then all of a sudden you realize there's like this depth and you're like oh my god like there's actually another element to uh to this existence you know so um so was that during your meditations uh, and listening yeah. to music yeah yeah it was during the meditations wow. you know it's, really, it's an interesting experience because fast forward to now I don't have these psychedelic transcendental experiences during meditation, you know, and um, this is my, uh, uh, this is why I think there's some kind of divine intervention because I, like, you know, given my story that I shared, like I was, I had an addictive personality. I was like, you know, addicted to a lot of things, you know, and if I had sat down and meditation was boring, you know, and there wasn't any dopamine hits or anything, I probably would have left it, you know, probably would have like fizzled out after a couple of weeks or whatever. But it's almost like it pulled me in, you know, it's like, because it felt so good, you know, it was like such a high, you know, it's like I would just sit down for 15 minutes, you know, well, I wasn't even doing like long meditations, it was like 15, 20 minutes I would meditate for, and I would like blast off to another dimension, <laughs> you know, and then I'd come back, and I'd be like, wow, like, you know, I didn't really, you know, realize that this is possible. But if you come forward to now, I don't really have these experiences. My meditations now are just very kind of still, you know, very, um, like quiet, you know, but uh, spirit kind of pulled me in <laughs> it was like like uh, with these really kind of feel good feelings you know and um yeah it was uh it was beautiful but also very painful you know it wasn't like just you know like oh you know you kind of open this door because what happened was in the first like six months after having one experience specifically with the third eye like explosion you know i, I don't know how how else to frame it but it's literally like a when it happened it was like a, i had a it sounded like a bone snapping or a stick snapping here and then it just exploded and i had like these kaleidoscopic visions you know that kind of happened and it was like there wasn't like time didn't exist you know it wasn't like you know like reflecting upon it now having experience with psychedelics it was very psychedelic you know but at the time i had no reference point for that you know but um the thing what happened was that happened and after that you know, I, I was just in bliss all the time. You know, I had like this period of around about six months of my life where life was just blissful, you know, and um, I kind of felt like I'd found the answer, you know, and I'd sit down in meditation and I'd blast off and I'd have these blissful experiences and everything just felt amazing, you know, like it was like, even though my life wasn't perfect, it just felt great. And um, I became quite attached to that, you know, like uh, unknowingly, you know, like sometimes you don't know you're attached to something until it stops happening. And after like around about six months of this absolute bliss all the time, I had like this dark night of the soul, you know, where these experiences stopped happening. You know, I was sitting down for meditation and just waiting and just like, where, you know, it, like, it was like a new addiction, you know, it's like, where, where are these experiences, you know? And, um, yeah, like I would sit down and nothing would happen. L luckily enough, I managed to keep up the practice, you know, and it was like maybe another six months or something of like, almost like feelings of despair, you know, like of like, you know, that um, eventually it kind I kind of came around to the, you know, okay, that's probably a passing phase, you know, in, in my life. And it's just something to accept, you know, and it's like, it's interesting when you apply hindsight to these things, you know, because they talk about it in the, uh, like, um, 
uh, sutras of Patanjali and stuff about, and uh, Hatha Yoga Pradipika is the one that I read, and they talk about siddhis, and siddhis are like these uh, um, almost like superhuman powers that come come to you if you practice meditation, yoga, and all these things like incrementally. But if you cling to them, you know, then it causes suffering. If you let them pass, then, you know, it's just a, just a, a phase of life, you know. So I didn't know that at the time, you know, and I cling <laughs> deeply, you know, to these experiences, you know. And, um, yeah, and then, you know, I had to go through this real kind of dark experience w- without any reference points, without any teacher, without any, you know, it was just, it was almost like I was, uh, you know, crawling around in the dark like trying to find answers to life you know and um eventually you know i just um found some kind of peace with it all you know mm. how um, long ago was it when you had the six months of bliss um i it was i get a little bit confused with my timelines but i, I think i was around it was around about when i was 22 you know i'm 33 now so it's like around about 11 years ago you know and um yeah it was um an interesting phase that was what I, I would say was the spiritual awakening, you know, like that was what it was, you know. So yeah, it was zero like, kind of intel, in, 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 intellectual understanding of it, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it. That's awesome that you, <laughs> yeah. you kind of had that and you just, it sounded like you were just in it and you were just allowed it to just be. But then it's, it's fascinating about the tendency to be attached to these things that these practices, these kind of, um, uh these tools that we allow ourselves to access kind of good states and healthy states within Mm -hmm. our mind but then i I was on a call last night actually and uh it was like mention a win that you've got in your life right now i mentioned a challenge and i was like a win is my um my my passion for yoga and Mm -hmm. my uh my practice at the moment but then a challenge is too much yoga (laughs) <laughs> mm-hmm. okay yeah <laughs> and uh and nina my partner always talks about this kind of um this this d- distraction and the, the the tools that you use to kind of um come into yourself and come into your center if you're doing them all the time you are distracting yourself from the thing that's causing you the need to do these practices you know so say there's yeah. something in your life or an experience that you've that you've um, it's causing an anxiety, a depression, or any anything like that, uh, and then you do these practices to kind of bring you back to yourself, so you can mm-hmm. feel back and and, and centered. But then mm-hmm. doing them too much is uh, is also kind of an yeah. area you can get into, and and it can yeah. be a distraction, right? Yeah. It's interesting because. Um... I've been a little, I go through phases, you know, at t- certain times I like, you know, I'm doing like two, three hours yoga, meditation, breath work every day, you know, and the other times I'm like a little bit more relaxed, you know, I don't necessarily even do any, you know, and it's like, um, and that used to cause me suffering, you know, cause I like, I'm starting to see life as cyclical, you know, like, and, and everyone's different. So it's not, my cycles are not necessarily going to be the same as anyone else's, but, um, it's like, there's certain times, um, when I, when I've been attached to doing my yoga and meditation, like, you know, like, so I, I will, you know, do it for an hour or so a day, every day for like a month or whatever, you know, and then I miss it and it causes me suffering, you know, because I've missed it, you know, it's like, oh man, I really need to fit in, you know, and you get like stressed about it and stuff, you know, and it's like, for me, it's like, what is the point of these practices? And um, ultimately it's um, about being present, you know, and being in the moment, you know, and just, uh, you know, and you can ultimately do that without meditation, without yoga, without any of it, you know, and I, I'm not quite there yet, you know, like, and I, I feel like that's probably what enlightenment looks like, you know, where you just, you don't need to do anything because <laughs> you just like chill when you've got it all, you know. Um, but yeah, I feel like there's um, something in, in it being the practice, you know, like meditate, they say meditation practice, right. You know, and it's like, 
um, it's almost like a practice of that single minded focus on one thing, you know, but if you can do that all the time, like in your conversations, in your eating your food in you know, whatever it might be, then the, the you don't really need the practice anymore. You know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. One thing I think really significant about yoga, um, and we've both done training in yoga. It's where we met in India. Yeah. So the cyclical experience of a yoga practice, mm. the the start is like infanthood, and you kind of and you go through balancing positions, and, mm. and 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 you're almost growing, and then you reach a peak, and then you come down, and at the end you die essentially, and you yeah. transcend. Not death as in what we know, but in a transcendence, yeah. and that that whole cyclical experience is life itself. Yeah. And it's so beautiful because, I mean, I do often find myself just going into a few stretches and I'm like, am I really, really, am I really, you know, practicing yoga right now? Am I, am I yeah. just stretching? And I'm, mm -hmm. where's my intention here? So is my intention to give this however long a cycle and go mm -hmm. through it, in it and out of it. Yeah. And once I do that, then, you know, I'm actually feeding the thing that is actually helping me you know <laughs> yeah yeah it's, inter it's interesting because I, I i i learned um they called it kundalini yoga in um in rishikesh but it was actually hatha yoga um but you know i i say that you know like where where do these practices come from it's like you know from india but it was hatha yoga practice with uh, the guidance of a guru you know i don't know if they usually have gurus at teacher trainings but that's that that's what it was uh, which was really beautiful um but then i came back to london and i learned egyptian yoga um which has been an interesting process and it kind of like has the um that's kind of what i teach now you know i teach the the egyptian yoga and it's um I've, i have a real kind of resonance with egypt um i had a lot a lot of my uh, ceremonies uh, my me plant medicine ceremonies like were just about egypt and stuff you know so they really kind of um um had a strong resonance with me and then synchronistically enough it was um i, I decided i wanted to do an egyptian yoga teacher training and you know like I'm, I'm all about like following the signs in life you know it's like i find it really interesting you know like when you follow the signs like real like magic happens i i, I just listened to the alchemist the book the alchemist again um so i'm i have a, f a four hour drive to pick my son up uh, in london and I, I went and got him uh the day before yesterday and i listened to the alchemist again um which is basically about following the signs and the synchronicities you know and uh finding the the gold within you know because like um um i've forgotten what point i think oh yeah egyptian yoga yeah, yeah talk um, to me about that because I'm, I'm yeah I'm, I'm waiting for you know yeah. <laughs> what is it <laughs> I've never heard it all, of it. It all, come, all comes together. But basically, I decided I wanted to do Egyptian yoga. I messaged my friend online and asked them if they knew anything about Egyptian yoga. And um, and they didn't get back to me, but I went out that day and I went into like a nice little vegan restaurant in, um, in, in London, Lewisham. And um, when I saw the person behind the counter and they had like this tattoo of like an Egyptian symbol on their face, you know, and I was like, okay, this is interesting. So I got chatting to him and I was like, do you know anyone who, uh, who teaches Egyptian yoga? And he's like, oh yeah, follow this guy on, on Instagram. He's, he's the guy. Meet know. me in the alley. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So then I went on Instagram, looked on his thing and his most latest post was oh, Egyptian yoga teacher training starting like next week or whatever it was, you know. So I was like, OK, cool. You know, like obviously like it's all kind of coming together. I spoke to him and, you know, then I ended up going and doing this uh, Egyptian yoga teacher training. Um, but the Egyptian yoga is, um, you know, because there's obviously um, India is known for yoga, right? Like it's uh, like the like people know it's the birthplace of yoga, um, like Pathanjali. I think is Pathan the Yoga Sutras of Pathanjali, I believe, are the first text, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. the Yoga Sutras are for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, they, um, but there's also a school of thought that you know things go beyond that. Beyond and, that, uh, yeah. Back to yeah. these these figures, which weren't they were kind of they weren't living people; they were almost yeah, entities. Yeah. But it gets very, very mystical and spiritual. Yeah, yeah, for sure, it gets re really quite mystical. But it's. Um, they say that in India, they systemized 
yoga for the first time that they, they wrote it down you know they created it but if you go back to like the medineta which are the hieroglyphs in egypt um they have pictures of people doing yoga postures and stuff on these hieroglyphs which like predate the uh the text is that like where that the... comes from yeah yeah there's all kinds of stuff i'm trying to see if i have any, <laughs> so any art whilst around. you're looking for, for <laughs> me i did hear some of the positions mm -hmm. and asanas as they're called mm -hmm. work stem from scandinavia and okay yeah I, I don't know if you heard that but yeah no, there, no, there were no. these there were these poses that were that were from scandinavia and, and from like a certain culture of stretching over there yeah the thing is like i have a, a like some things like uh, intuitive in life you know and it's like I, I don't necessarily have any like substantial facts to back this up but um, <laughs> the theory and case no need for <laughs> yeah. substantial facts here yes let's just make it all up <laughs> no but it's, it's like when you have like certain experiences like transcendental like psychedelic experiences and stuff you know like it really opens up your mind to a different way of, of thinking and and feeling and understanding and you know like there there is a chance that we perceive consciousness in a different way in earlier times you know it's not like we you know we, we tend to like we view the world like this but when you read older texts it's more like it's almost like they viewed the world as like you know an in, internal world you know now it's like external where everything's like oh look outside you know look at what i can acquire but before it seemed like you know more internal you know like and um you know like something like yoga for example like i imagine people have been stretching since they could move right <laughs> you know and i know yoga is not stretching entirely you know <laughs> but it's like i'm imagining people probably had these experiences experiences and maybe there wasn't a birthplace so to speak you know maybe human beings just intuitively understood certain things at uh, earlier stages you know and in, in uh, um in, in existence you know so um maybe it did stem from scandinavia maybe it came from uh egypt you know maybe it came from all of these places you know simultaneously because when you actually look at things and i'm not going to get too I, I can't explain this too well but you know like um if you I, i've read like graham hancock's work um uh, fingerprints of the gods and he talks about all these different like megalithic structures you know that exist like you know like there's like pyramids in mexico pyramids in egypt you know and all these places where they didn't like spend time with each other there you know they say that it was impossible for them to get to each other yet all these big megalithic buildings have uh, you know kind of uh, popped up you know simultaneously around about the same time you know so it's like i don't know if we really know that much about you know what's going on in the world you know and how things have unfolded yeah the more that. i know the more i know i don't know yeah and it's like when you try to apply a scientific you know kind of mindset to things that you know, don't necessarily make a ton of sense. You know, it's like it's this. Uh, I, I feel like there's a mysterious element. You know, to like yeah, you have like, to accept that and just know yeah. that there are things, and it'll allow you to go deeper if you just completely surrender to the not knowing and the and the yeah. mis and and it's, it's unexplainable. Actually, been learning the tarot recently, and uh, it's like quite quite new. But that basically, it's. Um, it has this i'll get back to egyptian yoga we'll, 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 we'll cut we'll make a roundabout point to this <laughs> yeah but um there's a correspondence with like there's something in um um the kabbalistic uh the um system it's like the hebrew mysticism right and um they have something called the sephira which is the tree of life you know and the tree of life is um is made up of 10 points called sephira and um they all connect to each other so like you know one is to do with like wisdom you know one's to do with mercy one's to do with grace you know and they all come from the first sephira called kitha you know which is uh the crown which is like you know the uh the birthplace of existence basically and what they do is like it will be like kitha the first sephira will go to the second sephira and that will create an archetype you know so it's like a person moving from like non-existence basically 
to wisdom, for example, and then that will be a tarot card, you know, and it all links like to the uh, 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet as well, you know, and it's like there's this like intricate connection, which basically these 22 uh, tarot cards and uh, the 10 sephirah, so there's 32 total, you can basically categorize anything into them, you know, like so like any type of experience, any plant, any food, you know, uh, any emotion, whatever, you can take them and you can, um, you know, hang it on a peg, so to speak, you know. And I'm, I'm still learning about this. I'm still like, uh, you know, in the, uh, I actually bought a book of, uh, called The Hermetic Art of Memory recently because um, one of the things that I've struggled is to retain information. You know, a lot of the time I, I read lots of things and then I kind of like make my own conclusions and I just kind of philosophize about, you know, certain elements of it, but I can't always remember the minute details. So I, I've decided to read this book, The Hermetic Art of Memory, so which helps you to remember things, you know. And I feel like what that does is it allows you to, you know, you know, say there's like Aleph, which is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, you know. It allows you to learn by association, you know. So it's like Aleph um, means, what does it mean? I think it means, uh, let me use one I understand, uh, understand a little bit better. There's Gimel, which is a letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And it also means camel, right? And it is also related to the high priestess tarot card, right? And at first it may seem like what, what's the uh, correlation between a high priestess and a camel? You know, it seems like there's like nothing there. But when you go into the what it actually means, the high priestess, it's to do with the um, infinite void, you know, it's to do with like intuition, it's to do with mystery, you know, and camels symbolically, they're like, you know, find their way around in the, the vast desert, you know. So there's like a, a metaphorical relationship between the two, you know, which you wouldn't necessarily see until like you kind of delve into these things deeply, you know. So it's been a, a very interesting experience of, uh, of learning and um, also finding a system in which you can hang all the all the archetypes and uh, all the different things and uh, remember everything uh, by by association you know? yeah so. i think when you're talking about learning and memory i think we're kind of all in a way conditioned to to at least lean into the same way of learning and it's just not true mm -hmm. I, I was probably a book or something i listened to about you need to find the way in which you learn and that sounds mm -hmm. like what you're tapping into and i don't yeah don't 100 yeah. believe i'm there yet but yeah. uh, i think if you if you really tune in and, and listen and, and understand the way in which you learn it, the doors open you know yeah sure. yeah sure. are you familiar with jason silver Yes, yes, okay. yes. I mean, I haven't really seen much as well. I used to watch his show actually back in the day. I can't remember Brain Games. I think. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. That was like you know back in the day. I used to watch that, and I, I, he's quite a character, you know. He, but now I've watched a few of his videos. He's, he's definitely uh, of that association mm -hmm. memory type. Yeah, yeah. 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 His shots of awe is his uh, is a YouTube channel, but he just okay. he just and he's fascinated with flow states. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, and mysticism and mythology and history, um, yeah. but yeah, he uh, he goes off on these com complete and uh, I wouldn't call them tangents because he's he, he's he's tapping into something, but in the way in which he's doing it, he's pulling in all these different association points, mm -hmm. and they're and they're the same thing, and that's how it uses to memorize. Yeah. It's fascinating. Yeah. So is this where we go back into the yoga of Egyptians? <laughs> yes, yes. Let's go back into the Egyptian yoga. That's a, this was a tangent, <laughs> yeah, officially. Um, but yeah, Egyptian yoga is uh, it's very similar, you know, like posture, posture wise, you know, like there, there's a few variants, you know, like uh, we do Ujjara. It's the same as sun salutations, you know, so it's like the journey of the sun, you know, but it's very much like you go from Ujjara into to like the the geb phase which is to do with earth and then you go into like the gods and the goddesses and then you end with um the death pose you know which is a uh, ke ke kepara um 
It's not Kepa, is it? Nahast, that's the one. Yeah, Nahast is like the name of the the the, the, the final pose, which is corpse pose. Um, but my experience with it has been it's like calling on like archetypal forces, you know. So it's like we're working, we're doing yoga, but we're like it's the the spiritual element of it is like calling on the archetypal because I have an a, a, a okay understanding of the uh, the gods and the goddesses, you know, and what they represent and what they stand for. So it's <clears throat> when you're doing a pose kind of related to one of the gods and goddesses, it's like you call on the energy of that god and goddess, you know, and um, um, you you bring it into the posture, and it's uh, been it's been a really interesting process because I've done like a, like do some work with like uh, medicines like different plant medicines and stuff and um I, I like have like shamanic drum and all this kind of stuff you know so i kind of like merged the two i don't teach yoga so much at the moment you know but when 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 i was teaching it i would like take people through the uh process with like you know kind of like interesting music you know i play like you know kind of i think i had like the best yoga playlist if i'm being honest you know? <laughs> <laughs> great playlist you know and then you take people through this journey with the, with the music and you know the visualizations because there's visualizations involved in it as well and um then when everyone goes down into savasana like nahast um I use my shamanic drum, you know, so I drum and like, like whistle a little bit and sing a little bit, you know, and it's, it tend to work very well. You know, people had like really kind of interesting experiences with it. Yeah. You know, I can so. imagine how that could work. We were on the beach the other day and um, we had a little circle and it was amazing. And this leads us nicely into psychedelics. If you'd like to talk about that, um, yeah. cause we haven't actually delved into it yet on the podcast. Okay. Um, so maybe you could be the the entry point. So we were on the <laughs> beach the other day, and then um, um, our friend Jane was just drumming, 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 and we, she got us to kind of sit. She set the scene in a in a in a meditation. She said, "Imagine you're you're falling through the earth, and and that's somewhere you've discovered maybe a crack in the tree, and you go down, and then uh, mm-hmm. you you find these animals, and they guide you and lead you into a, into another world." So we kind of had that as a pretext, precondition to go into. And then she just starts drumming, drumming, running around. And this is the first time she's uh, held that space for us. Mm-hmm. Not for me, sorry. And uh, she just starts running around. And this is middle of the day, like, well, close to the <laughs> evening. And she's running around she's, and she starts screaming. She starts mm-hmm. screaming and just shouting and just letting loose. And our, mm-hmm. all of our eyes were closed. But you could tell there was just like a, a different energy there. Um, yeah. just 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 literally she i think she was just in her own world but mm-hmm. also just tapping into kind of uh our all, all of our meditations and um mm-hmm. i won't go into my experience because it's pretty dark <laughs> and yeah. how we want to keep this within an hour but anyway yeah. this 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 chap comes over and he's like are you on dmt <laughs> and then she turns around and goes no, 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 we're not. No, no, no. And she goes, well, are you meditating? And then she's like, no, yeah, kind of, kind of meditating, yeah. And he's like, oh, sound? Yeah. <laughs> and the reason I say, tell that story is because, like, that is that, that, that was an interpretation of our situation. Yeah. From some young northern, northeastern lad who directly yeah. goes to DMT. And I, think, yeah. and I was like, wow. He's like a mm. teenager and he thinks that's yeah. what DMT is. But it's, yeah. but it's kind of gone off in a different direction. But the reason yeah. being, because I want to talk about psychedelics yeah. um, and and like the fact that this teenager knew or, or, or kind of interpreted that as being what DMT was. Yeah. Which was yeah. interesting. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, uh, I, I don't, I think DMT is like, I mean, depends on the type of dmt because there's a few different types of dmt um but for me i've never really felt like running around and, and dancing to be honest yeah. it's like it's a very interesting experience because um in comparison to other other psychedelic substances because I, I i kind of uh, would categorize dmt as like it's more like you turn up you know it's like you you smoke the dmt and then it's like you arrive and there's just this world that's not human, <laughs> you know, it's like, um, and it's been my experience that there's no, like, 
there's no up, down, left, right, you know, north, south, east, west kind of thing. It's just like you're there, you know, and it's like your back is your front and your front is your back and everything's like, you know, it's like you have this panoramic view of everything. And it gets weird sometimes, you know, you <laughs> like when you, you go into these realms, like you get these little hands on you, like cleaning you and like all these kind of um, interesting experiences. I, I mean, I, some people have like these elf like experiences where these like, you know, elves come and throw geometry at them and all this kind of stuff, you know, but um, for me, I haven't had the elves personally, but it's uh it's almost like a dream you know it's like you go into this like dreamy realm where everything is um abstract and mysterious you know everything's abstract and mysterious there's nothing there's no reference point there's no nothing that makes much sense to this kind of it's like you turn up in an alternate reality like an alternate dimension where nothing is the way it is here you know and then it, it happens you know, and it's it, like, I, I've found like there's the, these like, it's almost like, I don't know if you ever watch Formula One, mm-hmm. mm. yeah, you know, like when they move into the pit <laughs> stop, you know, yeah. and that's what it feels like. They move into the pit stop, they pump up the car, they change the tires, you know, quickly. That's what it feels like when you smoke DMT. So it's like you get there and it's like, there's like these like, like being kind of things there that are like, okay, something, another one, <laughs> you know, it's like changing of the tires. There's like, <laughs> And then you kind of wake up and it's like awakening from a dream. And it's like it, things kind of disappear. And it's like you can't, can't really explain what happened. But yeah, know, it's very ineffable, isn't happened. it? Um, yeah. I think the main question that I always ponder mm. and I let it go. It's not something that I hold on to, but it's, it's an interesting one to, to, to know if it's your your own mind constructing these things based on certain parts of your brain, just, you know, take, yeah. taking a back seat and letting others kind of thrive or, or, it, or are you being submerged into a, a different reality that we're not aware of due to our mm. limited five senses. Right. Yeah. And that's kind of what people grapple with. A lot of people definitely believe in, in the former, but, yeah. uh, but it is, it is ineffable. You can't really describe it. I mean, try describing, you know, smell to somebody who can't smell. Yeah. yeah <laughs> he just wouldn't yeah. be able to do it. And we do really yeah. try and explain. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, yeah, so I've, I've smoked Changa before. Okay. So, which I think is a strain of DMT or. Yeah, it's, it c- contains DMT. It so can... you have like free base DMT, which is like it in its pure form. And Changa is usually mixed with other, other herbs and stuff. Yeah, sure. A bit less. Yeah full on yeah. perhaps you yeah. kind of dance on the edges but the <laughs> dmt throws you in right yeah. um yeah. but yeah that and that experience for me was uh I, again it was i didn't i definitely didn't go fully in but the mm-hmm. dmt what that like, lasts for about 15 20 minutes mm-hmm. and that's pretty much that's pretty much it and then you're back and that's yeah. quite and that's quite good um in a way because you're not yeah. fully in like you are with most other psychedelics right yeah yeah, um, yeah. so uh, when did you first start kind of when were you introduced to it and when well psychedelics in general i suppose <laughs> yeah i mean it was a few years after i got into meditation you know i started to um I remember reading something, you know, and, and the ayahuasca coming up. Ayahuasca is like, a, it's a DMT containing plant, uh, which is called chacruna. And this the vine, which is called capi. And you mix the two. And, and the difference between ayahuasca is um, with like free base DMT, which you smoke, it lasts 15 minutes, you blast off, you come back with ayahuasca, the, the vine allows the DMT to be orally activated. And you end up having like a six hour trip, sometimes longer. I think the longest mine lasted was like 12 hours once, you know, it was very, very profound experience, <laughs> not the most fun experience of my life, but in a nutshell to, to take you to the end. So you can picture the scene. Everyone was having breakfast. <laughs> Everyone's experiences was finished. 
I was laying on the floor in the space where everyone was having breakfast, still fully tripping out while people were feeding me watermelon, trying to get me to come down. You know, so if you blast off, you can blast off. Basically, is what I'm saying. You know, um, but my uh, my my first experience with um, psychedelics were a few years after that, I started to read about ayahuasca, you know, um, I, I knew straight away that I wanted to go and do it in the Amazon. Um, but that wasn't, um, a, a direct option at the time. I couldn't do that. Like at the time, you know, because, uh, circumstances, you know, so, uh, I ended up getting some mushrooms, um, from a friend and, uh, yeah, I, I took one gram, which is a relatively small dose um, of mushrooms, and it kind of altered my perception of, uh, you know, it, it, I was going through an experience at the time where I was seeing lots of synchronicity, you know, and it was like I, I was on a search, you know, like and diving down these rabbit holes, you know, and it, it was a succession of events which in which... Um, you know, experiences with psychedelics, experiences with meditation, experiences with like synchronicities and everything all kind of merged together through a period of a couple of years where it just seemed to things would get kept getting deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper, you know, and it was, um, yeah. And, and that was my, my experience with, with psychedelics was like, it was just like a shift, you know, it was like a shift, like that you can, like the the world is can be experienced in many different ways you know and it was mildly psychedelic the first time you know and then a couple of months later i went in and had a bigger dose and um that was very very strong because i took a lot more you know it was like i took a gram the first time and the second time i took like three grams or something you know and um yeah that was when i started to see the visuals and you know kind of really kind of uh, interesting uh um, patterns and, and stuff. Um, but really what it done was just like break down, you know, barriers further of like, uh, sometimes when you have certain experiences, it's hard to explain in word. It's hard, it's hard to encapsulate what's happened, you know, but it's like when you experience certain things, it's like, you know, that, you know, to, you know, what you were saying earlier about, um, trying to explain smell to someone who's never sm smelt or what I said about, you know, experiencing a flat two-dimensional thing and then realizing it has the depth you know it's like it's like an opening to another portal of understanding like a deeper level of existence and a lot of it's mysterious you know and that's why it's hard to explain you know a lot of it is like you know the words cannot do it justice you can't sit someone down and explain to them what a psychedelic experience is if someone if someone if two people have had a psychedelic experience you can kind of converse about it and and share about it and they'll kind of understand but someone who hasn't had a psychedelic experience and you know someone who's very rational who has trying to relay that experience it's just not possible you know like it's uh you know it's uh, an opening of a of of a of a veil to a deeper level of understanding in 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 my experience you know? yeah and it opens up your own psyche really mm -hmm. it does seem yeah. to shine lights on what you are afraid of yeah more than yeah. anything and it also it you know it's very it can be very um <laughs> like the, it can make the mind quite rational you know it's like Sometimes you like, you know, be pondering an issue in your life for, you know, months on end or years even, you know, and it's like, how do I, you know, get over this, you know, like, you know, and then you'll be in a, you know, psychedelic thing. And then like a voice will just come to you and it'll just be something simple, like oh, just, uh, just eat good food. <laughs> and it's like, oh my God. Yes, of just, course. Just <laughs> yeah 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 well, just be nice to people most people are nice be nice to people it's like, oh yeah of mm. course you know and it's uh really like you know um my my personal experience with psychedelics uh you know like because i i did have some beautiful experiences and i had some very dark experiences as well and really what it come back to is love you know love compassion kindness you know being in service like it's like we're here 
you know no one really knows what's going on as much as people like to feel like you know they know what's going on it's like no one really knows what's going yeah, on yeah people like, are just I'm better really... at pretending they do yeah yeah but you, you don't know, get anyone like... who really knows what's going on yeah it's just not yeah. true it's a uh, rupert sheldrake uh he's i don't know if you know yeah him. yeah i do yeah i've heard him yeah, but he says, uh, like, the scientific community say, you know, give us one free miracle and we'll ex explain the rest, right? <laughs> you know, and I found that a really kind of interesting way to put it because it's like, you know, you might be able to explain, you know, how, like, all the matter works and, you know, the laws of physics and all this kind of stuff, which, again, is debatable depending upon who's saying it. But how did we get here? <laughs> you know, like, why, like, how did we, you know, and it, even if you can, even if you believe like it was the big bang or whatever, you know, like how did that happen? You know, and it, it's, it's like this infinite kind of thing. You can always go a step before, you know, in, in, in a like materialistic kind of perspective, you know, because if there's, you know, like everything kind of goes in succession, but then where did it start? You know, like if uh, this, it, you can't really ever, ever um explain that and that that's one of the things like not, not just um psychedelics but um altered states of consciousness i feel like it helps you to come to terms with that but also it gives you like it, it's almost like they, i've had experiences where you do experience like infinity you know like you experience it and it's like you're in it and you don't know you're in it until you're out of it again you know so it's like something happens you know and then because you're able to come away from it it's like you kind of get this experience and i feel like without being able to put put it into words it explains you know the infinite reality because you know it's like in yoga they talk of uh purusha and prakriti you know these two worlds like the, the you know one way to say would be the material world, world and the you know infinite you know or the higher self and the and the lower material self you know um but these kind of things these experiences they kind of tune you into that higher self they tune you into that infinity but then you come back you know and it's quite a relief when you come back because it's quite a lot you know being everything <laughs> you know like tuning into that everythingness you know like it's kind of like oh god thank god i can come back and just like eat a slice of pizza and you know kind of um you know have a yeah. like laugh my family and, and all this yeah kind of stuff, yeah you know? yeah so, it reminds yeah. me of a quote that i heard not too long ago you've always got to be able to fetch water and chop wood Oh, no matter yeah. no matter your light and experience whatever your experience yeah. has been you will yeah. always have to do that because we are in these meat suits these bodies yeah. and we gotta eat we gotta shit we gotta drink water <laughs> yeah, yeah. we gotta do all that and that's yeah. just that's just the reality yeah um but going back into this the psychedelic experience i mean i've taken mushrooms about four times mm -hmm. and every time and for, for me it's always been a non-recreational thing i've gone with a real big intention on my mm. own to yeah. either figure something out to get a few more answers to delve into more of a check-in to see where i'm at where my subconscious is at um and often they talk about set and setting your mindset and the setting in which you which you do the drug and mm. the substance whatever you want to call it i think obviously i could talk about my personal experience but one thing i do want to mention is it seems to be the setting in which you're in is so significant in mm -hmm. terms of the trip, the, mm -hmm. the, ex, it's the experience. If you do it in a more natural setting, mm -hmm. if you do it in a non-natural setting, in, in a house, in, in four walls, mm -hmm. uh, in a city, like there seems yeah. to be a really different resonance, a really different experience. Mm -hmm. It's almost like it's not meant to happen in that way which is mm -hmm. so interesting like yeah. fundamentally if you if you take it around people uh, who are say walking about on the main streets in a city driving around you, you, you and you're and you and you take mushrooms you will automatically tap into everything that doesn't make sense mm -hmm. you know what i mean that everything yeah, that's yeah. not in this almost conscious stay you it's just you can see through things a lot easier um yeah. and 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 just pick apart at things and why they are the way they are and what is happening there 
And I don't know if that's our subconscious, really, like our understanding of, you know, what is all this for? What, what direction are we going in? Why is that being built? Why are people walking and acting in this way? Yeah. When you're in nature, it just seems to make sense. And you're like, well, of course, that's, that's this, this is that. And it's just mm-hmm. more simple. And uh, I don't know, yeah. it, just, it, it just feels a lot, more, a lot more free, you know, yeah. a lot more yeah. real. It's, it's yeah. bizarre. Yeah. I feel like nature makes sense. You know, this is something that I've kind of um, come to the realisation. Like I, I've had in I was, when I was in London, you know, there was only one way. Like if I was ever stuck, like in a bit of a like emotional funk or whatever it might be, you know, like when you're feeling like, you know, that something's not not gelling right, you know, the the only fail proof method of of getting out of that is to go and spend time in nature, you know, and it's, you spend time in nature until life makes sense again, basically, you know, and usually it's like an hour or so, you know, that's enough, you know, you just go, you sit by a tree, you know, by a lake, by a river and uh, things just kind of make sense, you know, and um, yeah, that's been, um, it's, it's interesting because nature does make sense you know and a lot of the material world doesn't make sense a lot of it is constructed and a lot of it is you know i i, I appreciate i can appreciate um the city as well you know like and I, I spend time in london you know and it's like you look at like a big skyscraper it's like someone thought of that <laughs> and now it's there you know and it's like it's so incredible that someone can actually you know take a thought which originally you know, like Canary Wharf, for example, originally someone probably thought, oh, let's do a big pointy building here with a light on top. And, you know, and then, uh, you know, like this kind of come together, they must have done the plans up and, you know, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people have worked on it and worked inside it. And it's like, that was a thought. And now it's become this, you know, massive thing. So I can respect it from that perspective. Um, but also I feel like um, the concrete, materialistic um capitalistic lifestyle is destroying nature you know is this is is you know taking away and a lot of it is made up you know a lot of it is doesn't actually need to exist you know it's like we've created all these industries you know to kind of keep the machine ticking so to speak you know and i know it's been an interesting like last few months with this whole coronavirus thing, you know, and people having to spend time at home and having to spend time away from that system. And, you know, people having these awakenings, people, you know, it's like, Oh, I'm going to like play the piano. Now I've been wanting to do this for so long. Like let's sit and play the piano or do some yoga or, you know, like, or actually getting to spend some time with my kids and my girlfriend, you know, without interruption, you know, and I feel like it's, uh, you know, it's a very interesting situation that's unfolded you know and i think one of the things that's um going off on a bit of a tangent (laughs) you know (laughs) into the whole coronavirus situation i think one of the things that um has come to the surface uh, which i've observed has come to the surface is uh the western's irrational relationship with death you know the the western western like you know where it's like save people at any cost you know even if it even if the quality of life is is poor even if you know people are gonna like you know be on medications and you know be unhappy in a box you know with with a mask on with no fresh air it's like and you know ultimately it's like maybe there's some maybe there's a consciousness at work in something like the coronavirus you know like maybe there is a consciousness that's at work that is you know communicating with humanity in a way that's hard to understand from a rational perspective you know maybe it's telling people they're supposed to you know spend more time indoors maybe it's telling saying you know like people are sick you know like because it's mainly people with compromised immune systems that are you know are dying from these kind of things you know and maybe it's communicating but it's like communicating in like a more metaphorical kind of kind of way yeah i um i don't want to get censored so (laughs) (laughs) yeah so no i do because i really i think this is so important to talk about 
yeah, I like the yeah. angle we're taking on this coronavirus. Yeah, so yeah. I've got lots of questions, but uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll yeah, yeah. for another time, maybe a private, yeah, I'm, private I'm, one-on-one. Yeah, yeah. yeah I don't no, want to upset yeah. anyone, but maybe I do because I think that's important to also. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, no, we don't have to delve into that. No, like, I know, yeah. But, but the angle in which we, 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 we're going into, it is our relationship with death. And I think this yeah. could, you could parallel with meshing with nature and then um you, you know you, you cut down so many trees and the 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 weather system changes and uh, and uh, and the you know gases are in the air it's pumping up you know you you, you mess with the atmosphere it's going to shift and then you're going to see the repercussions of that you mess with nature you you farm animals in a certain way there are going to be repercussions there's consequences for everything we do even being vegan, even being whatever, there's consequences. You just, we've got to figure out which one's more conscious or which ones we, we want to tap into and, and live our lives by. But it's like that. It's like there are things out in this world that are always going to try and take over us. They're trying to kill us. Mosquitoes, you could talk about so many different things, for example. There are always going to be disease. Um, and this is this is one of them, but it's it's it is that relationship with death. At what cost do we protect ourselves? At what cost do we save lives? Like, what lives do you want to live in? I've talked to people, and they've said, "Whatever it takes, I will do whatever it takes to keep myself safe and my family." And I'm like, "So you're never going to come into contact with people again? So you're going to wear a mask for the rest of your life? Whatever it takes." And I'm like, "Well." you do you i'm not telling you what you can and can't do but yeah. for me it's very different mm -hmm. yeah this and this does parallel with the psychedelic i, I knew there was a, a point in me saying this because it does parallel with the psychedelic experience because uh john hopkins i believe it was john hopkins university have done studies with uh terminally ill cancer patients you know um and psilocybin mushrooms yeah know? and I, I could i can't give you all the data because i can't remember but basically they gave people um psilocybin mushrooms um i think they'd done it at a double blind you know so some got placebo some got the the mushrooms and um like a significant amount you know of people who had these experiences became a lot more comfortable with the idea of death you know they were like, you know, because these are people that are dying, you know. So, you know, I feel like there's something in certain substances, you know, like um, 5-MeO-DMT, for example, which is, um, it's like, um, comes from a toad, you know, and it's uh, like, it's like DMT, but a lot stronger, you know. Um, and it gives you, it, for me, I can't say that it is this, but my understanding it, it was it, it felt like a death experience. You know, it felt like, you know, when people talk about seeing the white light and, you know, all this kind of stuff, it was almost like a dying, but being reborn as everything and then coming back to this exact existence. You know, it was like that death and like unification with all, you know, and then coming back to, 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 luke you know the the avatar of luke you know and it was uh you know some really 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 profound experiences can happen with all of these like different medicines you know and it's um you know i'm i'm not it, like an advocate for irresponsible use of these medicines though you know because like if you're not ready then they can be um detrimental and the experiences you know the the altered states of consciousness that you can reach through psychedelics you can do through breath work through yoga through meditation all this kind of stuff the only thing the only difference is is the culture we're living in you know no one wants to not many people want to spend you know i mean i i think i got lucky with my meditation you know it's like a couple of weeks in i'm like Woo! flying out my body and stuff you know like some people spend years in the ashram and that doesn't happen you know but like and and that's you know kind of i, I feel like it's the it kind of fits society you know it's like you know pe people probably don't want to spend years in the ashram don't necessarily want to do with the yoga and everything but psych psychedelics on the other hand you know they are 
you know, if you eat five grams of mushrooms, you know, dried mushrooms, something's going to happen, <laughs> you know, like it's not necessarily going to make your, your life better, but you're going to have an experience, you know, that's going to be profound, you know, unless you have an incredibly high tolerance to them, you know, and, um, you know, I feel like there is something in this psychedelic renaissance that's happening now that can can give people, you know, because we, we've ha held ceremonies for people in the past, you know, and, and stuff, and uh, people, they have experiences, you know, like we had a guy who gave up alcohol, you know, after after having this experience, and uh, someone who gave up smoking after the, the, uh, one of these experiences, you know, and I, that is a very Western way to look at it, like, what do you get, <laughs> you know, like, what do you give up, <laughs> you know, like, what, you know, like, and... I don't, I tend not to look at it that way. I tend to look at it more like you take up a new way of being that allows things to fall away, you know? So the anxiety cannot live in a higher vibrational um, frequency. You know, the depression can't live there, you know, like the negative addictions and all this kind of stuff. And this doesn't necessarily mean you take some substances and your life's like hunky dory and everything's great. Actually, it can be very difficult. You know, like you can have these experiences and it's like, Oh my God, my family are not accepting this new like experience that I've had, you know, and everything can kind of collapse, you know, it can be like this uh, process of collapsing, you know? Well, thanks for coming on, mate. You, uh, you, you do bring, element of joy to uh, any conversation oh, thank you, you do man uh, i know you can't see my face but uh, yeah <laughs> feel your smile you feel the smile <laughs> yeah um yeah awesome mate thanks for coming on there's so much more i mean i'd love to talk to you about so um, i think yeah we Let's definitely need to stay in touch more bro yeah, um because sure. uh oh yeah let's actually briefly could you just give a bit of an overview for your potential for change uh, channel website and then uh, oh. let people know where they can reach you or learn about you a bit more and yeah. um, maybe read some articles because I know you're a bit of a writer yeah so uh, potential for change is my website um, you can just go there and check out the stuff that, that I'm doing there I actually need to make some edits there because I haven't uh, been on there for a while but you can download a fr I've written an ebook actually after um, India um in india inspired an ebook called letting go the philosophical and practical guide to freedom so you can go to potentialforchange.com and there'll be a link for you to be able to download that ebook there and um yeah and uh, i that that's the way i communicate predominantly is via email so when people sign up for my uh list um that's that's the way i communicate um so yeah you can go to potentialforchange.com and check all that out Amazing. All right, man. Thanks for awesome. coming on and uh, yeah, peace. Peace out, brother. Oh.